Hey, it's Nimble Fatty here. Come join me at the Oil Bunker, the premier place to watch the Texas Children's Hospital golf tournament. We're going to play poker. We're going to eat some great food. We're going to have a cold drink, all with the coolest people in the energy business. Hey everybody, welcome to Chuck Yates Needs a Job, the podcast. Very interesting. Got a text. Somebody said, hey, this guy wants to come on your podcast. I said, who is it? They said, it's a man with two first names. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Chris. That's right. Doug, nice to meet you. The, Pleasure uh, to be here. So we were talking earlier. We have met, we haven't met. Where, where did we shake out I think we met in passing many, many moons ago. Um at both of our in both of our former lives, right on the uh, you at one of your former employers and me at one of my former employers. So we can actually say their name. <laughs> I, I, I think the restraining order okay. is worn off. <laughs> we can say Kane. Actually, uh, actually, I uh, I still get along with the Kane guys. Talked with them. Uh, talked with them a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. So yeah. The uh, okay. So we did meet. Good to see you. Yes. Again. Although it, I've gotten to the point in life where it's just. I just say good to see you because I right. can't remember who I've met and who I haven't met. So I know nothing about diversified energy except that y'all get ragged on in the press periodically. So pitch me the stock. Why, sure. why do I want to own this thing? Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, glad to be here. Um, glad to be in 75 degrees and sunny. I came from the New York City metro area where it was 21 degrees and there was four inches of snow on the ground when i left this morning so Ooh. so so my girlfriend's british and we spent i don't know call it i was five out of seven weeks or six out of eight weeks and she was there the full eight weeks over in london kind of over christmas and it was so cold and i was standing on the driveway of her best friend's house and i must have been shaking i didn't even realize it <laughs> And she comes up and hugs me and says, oh, is my little Texan going to make it today? <laughs> and I was like, I just want to go home and eat a taco. <laughs> please, please just let me go back home. So, yeah. Yeah. No, good to be here. Yeah. So so Diversified Energy, we are definitely a, a different company than a lot of the traditional EMP companies based here in the in the U.S. And what I mean by that is uh, we, we liken ourselves to be a solutions-based um, energy provider. And what I mean by that is really, we're not a driller. So we acquire mature, existing, producing assets from other operators or private equity companies or out of, um, out of bankruptcy and manage those assets under our stewardship model, uh, which is highly focused on improving the emissions as well as the long-term production of these assets. Um, the company started out in 2000 uh, by a gentleman by the name of uh, Rusty Hudson. He's from West Virginia, born and bred, and he had wells on his property as he was growing up. His dad and his grandfather were involved in, in the business, and he was a commercial banker and saw an opportunity during that time for what we would, I know you and I are probably of the same age group, but the, the Generation Xers or Millennials would call it like the side hustle. That's right. what he did, right? He's like, all right, I'm going to acquire some of these wells. I'm going to go out and, you know, take out a home equity loan and acquire some more of them because they were cash flowing assets, right? These mature assets that produce in perpetuity with very low decline, don't take a lot of maintenance, but have 50 year production lives on them are good, steady cash flowing assets. That's what he saw. And ultimately what he saw after he built that up and got to a point where it was big enough that it couldn't just be his side hustle anymore. It was, all right, I got to make a decision. And I think his wife helped him along with that decision at some point along the way. Um, that he so also saw that a lot of these names or companies in the Appalachian Basin were not focused on this area, right? When you think about your traditional GNA structure of an EMP, it's all structured towards the drill bit, right? right. It's it's what's the capex going to be? I've got petroleum engineers, I've got land guys, I've got drilling engineers, 
all focused on getting the highest return, whether you believe the PowerPoint presentations, 100 plus percent return out of those assets at the drill bit level. What he saw was they also had these mature assets, some conventional, some longer term shale assets that, uh, that nobody was focused on. But there was life in those wells because they have a long producing life. So it's re- it was really his opportunity to go out and acquire those assets from those producers and make it into a business. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the end of life stuff used to, I mean, pre-shale revolution actually used to be something that people would spend some time with because they'd go fix up things and they'd sell it to somebody else. And then shale came along, nobody wanted to buy that stuff anymore. Why, why touch it? Yeah. And drill drill one well and put on a thousand barrels a day of oil. That's a lot more exciting than being a plumber. That's you know, right. No, around. that's right. It, yeah. and, and it's what your what your returns profile is, what you're looking for, right? This it's a it's a lower returns profile. Um, but we but it's a steady returns profile. And what we've been able to do, uh, the company went public in 2017, since public is establish a track record really of managing these assets, growing production company went public, we had roughly about 50 million cubic feet a day of production. We're just shy of a B right now, seven years later. Um, We've done $1.2 billion of equity raises and returned almost 800 million in capital to those shareholders through dividends and strategic share repurchases. So it's a it's a highly reliable cash flow stream. Wow! So y'all are big. So what what's maybe the market value of the equity? Uh, so we're right as of now, roughly about U.S. dollars, six hundred million. Six hundred million. Yeah. Okay. Now, off of a you know we're a, a natural gas company predominantly. Oh yeah. So our production is eighty five percent natural gas. So we've gotten some headwinds from from that over the last year, as well as. Uh, primarily being listed in the London stock market, which has had 39 months of outflows and the knock-on effects of Brexit and fund redemptions that have been challenging. But what we did see more recently is the opportunity to come to the New York Stock Exchange. So we listed our shares on the New York Stock Exchange. It was an arduous process. Um, It took about six to nine months, but in December, we listed in the New York Stock Exchange. So now we have got a, a, a U.S. listing as well. A dual listing. A dual listing. Well, there yes. you go. But what? But it accomplished a couple of things, Chuck. I've been it, I've been told if uh, I'll marry the girlfriend, I get a British passport. Okay. So kind of there you go. <laughs> a dual listing, if yeah. you will. Um, what it did accomplish? Real quick. Go ahead. Uh, how much debt do you guys have? So we've got about one point two billion of debt. Okay, so all told, about one point eight billion in, in enterprise That's value. Right. Gotcha. That's right. And, and I won't even ask EBITDA numbers and all that because it's ridiculous at a buck fifty gas. I mean, right. Well, know. I mean, we we put out our pre-release um, for twenty twenty three, right? So kind of the, the preview numbers, and again, all public, but we had uh, five hundred forty to five hundred forty five is our our range that we kind of put out there of EBITDA. Gotcha. For the year, so so again, it's a steady cash flowing asset. Um, the other, do you, you guys hedge? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a lot. So we've got about in 2023, we were about 85 percent hedged. 2024 will be about 80 percent hedged. Part of that is again focusing on the cash flows and reliability of those cash flows as part of the return of capital strategy to to pay dividends or or buy back shares. Uh, part of it is as well. We utilize that construct to really lean into ABS structures to finance our our debt profile. So okay, you're gonna have to explain this to me because I actually did a podcast with a with a guy. Spent an hour and a half talking about this. I was more confused at the end. Okay, than I there was at the beginning. So what's an ABS? Sure, a- ABS um, or as we call them, special purpose vehicles, um, is an asset backed security. So basically what we've done is we've taken a group of assets, for example, wells that produce in Eastern uh, or Western West Virginia, but put those all into a special purpose vehicle an asset backed security. Right. Those assets have cash flows. Yep. Uh, they have the profile of being very low decline. Um, our corporate decline as a company is just under 10%. 
but Holy an, cow. but an Appalachian as those assets in particular would be four to five percent decline, and they've got perpetuity. The engineered life by third party Netherlands and Sewell is roughly about seventy five years. Yeah. So you take those assets, you put them into this ABS structure. The buyers of these are generally insurance companies. You hedge a good portion of that over the first three to five years out, um, and then a li- little lighter in the back end. But it's all, um, the cash flows are all using the curve, right? And so you've got predictability of cash flows. It's an elegant way to finance through debt the business because it's got a low cost of capital. So we've done seven of these ABS structures. It's roughly about five and a half percent cost of capital or coupon. Um, and they've got, let's call it roughly between eight to 10 years of maturity. They're all investment grade rated. Um, and they're all, uh, the last three that we did are also sustainability linked. So Fitch has come out and give us a sustainability um, rating on those. And you get a little bit of a kicker for safety metrics or or other attributes that are in there. So let's let's put some math to this to, sure. to see if I can understand this. So let's say PDP PV10 of those assets is 100. Just right. to p- pick a number. Back in the day, I could go to a commercial bank and, and, and kind of twist their arm a little bit and beg and plead and maybe get them to loan me 60 million on that. Right. Something like that. They'd say, hey, I need you 80% hedged for at least three years or you know something like that i can get you i can get you 60 million dollars and the rate was kind of whatever libor plus right whatever uh the the rate was it sounds like what i just heard you say and then i'm going to guess at what the answer needs to be is your rate is potentially lower than comparing it to a commercial bank today which is crazy to me but good for you guys um and then number two am i getting a higher advance rate yes ballparkish what so so what what instead of 60 am i getting well so if you were to get 60 on on a on an rbl these days i would say go do that all day long because Uh, because i'm not getting that you're not getting that okay if you're getting 40 to 45 percent it's a good day okay you're also having to deal with higher interest rates in this environment, right? And, and so for plus. And, and, being, and people sit there and used to say all this, oh, well, I've got this bank deal in place. They can re- they can review the 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 borrowing base anytime they want. That's, I mean, you that know, is so the don't, other. Don't act, yeah, don't act like that's secure capital. No, that's right. And that is the other aspect of it too that makes what we've done a little bit uh, more advantageous for us uh, because we're not drilling. So there's no... There's no uh, PUD value, right, or kind of you know undeveloped acreage that gets potentially put on um, some of these assets that you kind of bring up over time through a development program because we're just focused on the PDP. So you're only going to get 40 to 45, and you've got that redetermination risk, and it depends on you know how the wind blows that day, what the commodity right. price is going to be with natural gas. Sometimes it's pretty punitive. So, so you don't have a lot of those risks. Now, to be clear, we still utilize an RBL. So we still have an RBL. Right. Um, we, as a matter of fact, have changed that to a sustainably linked loan as well because of the, the stewardship um, attributes that we have with our company in terms of reducing emissions and safety metrics. And so, so that's what it is now known as, is a sustainably linked loan. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. And is, is that something I can get from any bank or is that a special bank these days? No, no. It's uh, uh, no. I mean, it's your typical uh, bulge bracket banking firms out there that are in our RBL um, grouping. Right. And, and there's not a specific, but you get rated by it's usually Fitch Sustainable that that rates that um, that product. Yeah, we didn't have that back. No, back this when is I was- a- this when is was, a newest thing for sure. So, so going back to our our ABS deal, we have the hundred of PDP PV ten. We put the hedges on place that the insurance companies want. We go to Fitch, we get our ratings. We're getting let's call it five and a half percent interest rate. 
how much money are we getting then instead getting, of the 40 to 45? You're getting 60 to 70 percent. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a big difference in advance rate. That's right. one of the, the big attributes to it. And, is, and then does yeah. the... Oh, and, and they're fully amortizing. Okay. So you're paying off those notes over the life of the, the tenor of those assets or, or of the tenor of the, that note. So for example, as I mentioned, most of them are eight to 10 year uh, tenors. Yep. So at the end of that period, you've got no debt, right? Okay. So it's fully amortizing. It amortizes down the whole thing. The, the biggest part of this is that you've got, let's say a 50 plus year asset that you're financing with a 10 year instrument. Yeah. So after 10 years, there's still a lot of value left in these assets. And I mean, are you paying more than five or six years cash flow on an acquisition? No, no. Yeah. So, so our framework has generally been to be within two to three times cash flow, PV 16 to 20. And in terms of the acquisitions that we've made, that's kind of the framework. More recently, it's been that two and a half to three times cash flow, but we actually did sell an asset not you know, at the beginning of this year through a, a structure such as this that we actually realized almost six times cash flow. So we were able to buy an asset, cash flow it for four years, and then sell it at for two and a half times, and then cash flow four years, sell it at six times cash flow. And so is the so the asset backed. Um, it's a loan and amortizes and then it reverts back to you. That's right. Yeah. Because we're the ultimate owner of it. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And y'all just, and the situation you just said was now we turned around and sold it. That's right. Because there's equity value, just like you would have in your house, right? You pay down your mortgage after a certain period of time, you've got equity value in it. And you could sell that equity value either by taking a loan out of it or, or taking money out of it or someone will buy it from you. So the ABS market for the energy space is growing dramatically. And why is that? I just, you know, I would have thought, I would have thought the ESG cloud or whatever you want to say would contaminate that capital as well. And it just doesn't seem to be. No. That was what uh, this guy, Robert Smith, came on the podcast about two years ago and he had done worked on one of the first ones. Right. And he said, no, it didn't, because you securitize somehow. It makes everybody feel much greener. Right. Well, you know, as I mentioned, we do have some sustainably linked um, at attributes to these. So that's helpful. But really, the insurance companies, let's be clear, right? At the end of the day, they, they, want, it, they want cash flow. So they've got right. low risk, investment grade cash flows that they could lock in. Um, and it's a, it's a new asset product really for, for them to. And I think what the other reason why it started to evolve more is there's more Mat mature producing assets out there in the marketplace these days, right? That have come off of their their hy hyperbolic decline, right? And they've kind of are in more of the terminal decline aspect of their production. So the so more companies have utilized them. I mean, when our treasurer and others started going to these ABS conferences, there's a big one in Las Vegas, and then there's another big one in Miami. Um, yeah, I mean, they went. Not too long ago, they had like 45 meetings in one day. Crazy. Yeah. Because everyone wants to, to meet with us uh, because we've done these and done them successful and have seen. The other aspect is for we also have partnered with uh, another company, Oak Tree Capital, um, to help us in terms of financing some of these assets on kind of a, a working capital uh, or, or working interest construct. So in other words... The assets are there. They kick in half the capital. We get a you know fifty two forty eight split on those assets. Yeah, no Oak, Oak Tree loves low multiple businesses. Yes, they, are, they always have been, and they've always found a uh, found a way to play it. It was back in the dot com era when we were doing all these flywheels and fuel cells and all this crazy energy stuff back in the late nineties. Uh, Oak Tree was running around going, hmm, do those guys have inverters in their in their fuel cell somewhere? Or do they have this little uh this little switch they need? 
Oh, where's that business? Oh, I can buy it for three times EBITDA. Right. But yeah. They were always great at being able to figure that out. So, so this is kind of cool. Do you, do you guys, I mean, you guys don't pay a dividend at this point, do you? We do. You do. We do. Okay. We do play, pay. A, the stock has sold off over the last six months. So the, the rate is pretty high, but it's been, it's a fixed dividend um, that we've had. So the target that we had targeted is roughly around 10% ish. Um, but it's it's increased with the shell off in the share price. But but I think for us, there's really a couple of ways that we think about capital allocation and return of capital to shareholders. You know, one of them is you know paying down debt, and so continuously yeah. delevering the business as we can is was priority probably number one. Uh, return of capital to shareholders either through dividends or how how's the debt structured i mean do you, is it all kind of revolver type stuff with senior banks or do you have some structure and term to it no so it's it's um it's all rbl so okay. there's you know of the one point uh you know call it two billion dollars we've got 1.25 billion dollars outstanding uh, there's about um, you know a couple hundred on the RBL, and then the balance is in the ABS structures. Okay. Yeah, and that's it. And those ABS structures, like I said, have anywhere from a eight to ten year life. At this point, where how they're kind of stacked by 2030, all the debt will be off the balance sheet. And, okay. And as you go out to 2026, it actually because of the way the cash flows are structured and we did a number of these when commodity prices were high, um, that a big portion of the payoff actually happens by 2026. So you'll be half of, of that amount on the books by 20, at the end of 2026. Anything, anything weird happening there or it's so hedged up that you're going to get it's all just, that paid off? No, no, it's, it's okay. all hedged up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, okay. So got a dividend, you got that. Now, um so is today kind of when you're sitting there in the corporate offices is a you know great day prices are low great time to buy all that or is it does it just put such a strain on on running the business and and looking at it that uh it's yucky time it it really just depends what lens you're looking at it through right um I mean, I tend to be a glasses half full guy, so I view it as an opportunity. I think a number of our executives view it as an opportunity. They've they've lived through low commodity prices, and that's really where the business started and was yeah. built in that low commodity price environment. As I mentioned, we we grow through acquisition, right? We're not growing through the drill bit. So, yeah. so we've got fixed costs, we've got low operating expenses. Um, we've got no capex really to speak of, right? Our run rate capex on a sustainable longer term is roughly about fifty million dollars. So it's which is all work large workovers or other capital projects that we're working on. So it's not a lot of capex spend. So you change out a plunger lift every that, once in a while. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So so that you know those type of things are are what we're spending capital on. And it allows us to really focus on growth through acquisition. And there are a couple of different buckets where those acquisitions come from. One of them is coming from majors. So for example, um, ConocoPhillips. Last fall, we bought an asset for them from them for about $225 million. They've constantly got a list of assets that are, they're looking to sell, right? And, you know, we don't pay for any of the undeveloped or anything that comes along with it. It's strictly what's the PDP cash flow. That's kind of our mantra and construct. So we worked with them, bought that asset. But as I, we were talking about earlier, the structure in the GNA and how this business started was really around people not focusing on that. And so if, you, if you're working for a ConocoPhillips or they've got something that's in their divestiture portfolio, they're not spending any money on these assets. They've got no well tenders, no operators out there on those assets. So we, that asset package was 1,800 wells. There were 400 wells that were just not turned on, not because they weren't productive or had issues or operational problems, because there was nobody in the field to manage those. 
nobody to monitor the emissions that were coming off those assets, which were prim primarily natural gas assets. So that's the low hanging fruit that we're not paying for because they're not producing that we get upside for free. Um, you know, another, so that's one kind of bucket. Is and that's of, real. Yeah. I mean, I saw that throughout my career yeah. all the time. I mean, if you're, I mean, think about it. If you're the young engineer at Conoco, do you want to go out there and mess with a, you know, 15, 20 MCF or what, uh, you know, a right. day well, or do you want to go drill, you know, three mile lateral? Right. Right. That's so, right. Yeah. So, so that's one bucket. Another bucket is when there's kind of stress in the market, either from high leverage or, or other attributes from a company. Um, one of the examples I would point to, so we bought some assets from a company called Edgemark up in Ohio um, and Pennsylvania. And those, the company was going through a bankruptcy reorganization. So we were able to, to buy some of those assets at a fairly cheap price Turn around. Those assets came with undeveloped acreage. There was a power plant that was just starting up in Ohio that needed feedstock. So we bought the assets for you know, let's call it pennies on the dollar, um, and then we turned around and made a contract with this power plant. They we contributed the acreage. They contributed the dollars. We operated it, drilled some of those wells for them then operated them, that feedstock went to the, to the plant to go feed their natural gas power plant. So we turned at that, we, when we bought the assets, it was a PV-22. We turned that into from ultimately the selling off some of those, that acreage and completing some of the ducts and some of these undeveloped wells for them to PV-40 right. relatively quickly. Another example um, from a private equity firm. So they had some assets that were for sale in the Haynesville Cotton Valley area, right? So East Texas. They put those assets on the market. Again, we just paid for the PDP value. They had, there was a number of undeveloped acres and a number of you know, drill sites that were kind of pad ready. We bought all of those, right? Again, it was a small package, but we bought it. We turned around and sold the undeveloped acreage in those kind of drill ready sites to another operator for $70 million. We paid $200 million for the assets. So we, we turned that from a PV kind of 18 into a PV 30 relatively quickly by selling those undeveloped assets. So those are kind of the three, you know, you've got your private equity sellers, you've got your distressed environment sellers, and you've got your majors looking to offload um, some of their non-core assets. So I will tell this story and you opine on it. It used to be way back in the day, maybe we'll queue up Bruce Springsteen's okay. glory days or something. Hey, I'm from New Jersey. We like Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, glory <laughs> days. Um, but uh, it used to be that you kind of made the assumption that an, an active well bore, it's going to cost you to P&A it about what, the equipment's worth that's in it that you yank out. And so those were always kind of a net zero and you didn't think about them. Well, then at some point we were kind of like, well, maybe we need to pay more attention to these things. And at least we had a PNA schedule that we would put together with an acquisition, but it was the last page of the book. We always, you know, broke for the board dinner before we went through the PNA right. schedule, all that. Man, the last two years at Kane, we were probably that was probably the first schedule we were uh, we were looking at, and we were actually asking questions about no, 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 really, when are we shutting in this well? You right. know, don't don't tell me you know twenty fifty seven or or whatever the, the the case may be. It would seem to me that would be if you guys mess something up, that's where y'all would mess up. You underestimated what P and A costs would be. You pushed it out too far, and historically, it's coming due. Talk to me about that. Sure. And how's your, what y'all's process around? Yeah. That? So it, it's a it's a very evolved process, and and candidly, you know what I would say it's one of the um, fascinating attributes of our business because what we've done is turned what would be a liability into an asset at the end of the day. So when you think about P and Aing a well. And, and retiring that asset or retiring that well, 
when the company first started going down that path and needed to retire some of those wells, they were doing what everyone else in every other basin did, <laughs> which was kind of you know roll that cost into their completions cost or, or roll it into a longer term um, oil services cost, right? And it was always, yeah, you know, what is it going to, ah, 120, $150,000. Nobody cared because everyone was so focused on, all right, we're getting a good completions contract. That's it. Hmm. What the company found out, and, and they did a couple of those wells by those, you know, larger third party um, oil service field companies. And what they found out was, this seems like a lot, right? This isn't drilling a brand new, unconventional five mile long well, right? This is some, a conventional well that's been here for a while, doesn't have a lot of moving parts. It should be simpler. So they brought in some professionals and started doing them themselves. And all of a sudden, it went from 100 and 120 to 30, 25. What we did is we built out our own asset retirement company within our business. So we now, through acquisition and organic growth, we've got... Uh, 17 rigs, 15 full-time crews that are not only retiring our own wells for diversified, but we've also partnered with the states of West Virginia, the state of Ohio, more recently the state of Pennsylvania, to retire their orphan wells, which I'm sure you know is a is a big you know topic, a hot topic now. Good orphan God. wells. The number of times I had Sarah Stodgener on my uh, podcast talking about zombie wells. Yeah. So, so there, the, I mean, when you look at that, that map, I mean, you know, there's, you know, call it 20 to 30,000 in West Virginia, call it 30 ish thousand in Ohio, Pennsylvania, the numbers are all over the map. You, you could, you've heard numbers as high as 200,000 yeah. orphan wells. Um, so, so we partner with those states to help them with that process. So last year we have, for ourselves, retired 200 of our own wells. We've got long-term agreements with the states to require between Ohio, West Virginia, and um, and Pennsylvania, 90 wells. So we did 200 of our own. So we more than doubled what we're actually required to do. And we did another 184 for the state of West Virginia and the state of Ohio. That's all third-party revenue that offsets any of those costs that it's going to cost us to, you know, longer term to retire our own wells. So our cost before any of the offset um, last, uh, we haven't put out last year, but the year before was roughly about $23,000 all in to retire our own wells. So yes, it's a longer term liability, but we've managed it in such a way that we've turned it into an asset for the company by building out this asset retirement company within Diversified. So you can actually you can actually price it and not I mean cuz y'all you guys are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. The so the criticism on you guys as I understand well, there's a lot. <laughs> Welcome to pick, my world. Pick, Welcome to my world. Dude. Listen, we li we live in the fossil fuel world and and there are naysayers, right? On on that. And um but but it is it is out there on on us as well as other companies. Yeah, and 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 my question on all all of that stuff because I've got I had a I have a dear friend who literally like chained herself to a refinery, you know, as a member of Greenpeace right. and all this. And that being said, she's adorable and wonderful, and she's come on the podcast and said her part. And, and the thing we just dis fundamentally disagree on is I think at the end of the day, if you're making something better, that's a worthy thing that we should undertake. And I think her point is we have to stop now because if we don't stop now, we just become more dependent and, and we, we, you know, continue the climate disaster, et cetera. So just disagree. So when I read the criticism of y'all having never done a deal with y'all, having never been out into your field or all that, I can't tell the difference between these guys are buying the bottom of the barrel, you know, last end of life wells that were drilled 40 and 50 years ago. They're just bad wells. And the fact that they're p and in them, they're doing this stuff, reducing methane emissions is actually good. I don't know if it's that. 
or are y'all just having to watch every nickel that maybe you're being cheap operators so how how would how would you frame y'all's y'all's approach sure so I, I think as we kind of started out you know we're we're viewing ourselves and our approach is really a solutions-based business providing solutions to the the energy transition if you will and there's a there's a wedge of production right we all know that there's this mature production existing production out there that on any given day is probably 10 to 13 percent of the the energy produced in the u.s that can't go away without major consequences so so we're providing an opportunity for these existing assets that are out there to put them in hands that are going to manage them in a more stewardship manner. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we buy these assets, we will go out, address the, um, the pad sites, address emissions, fix any leaks. I mean, we've got a zero leak policy, right? And, and we go out, if there's a leak, we fix it. Some of these, the, these leaks are as simple as all you got to do is turn a wrench on, on a wellhead, right. right? I mean, th these are not highly, but if there's nobody out there in the field to do that, Yes, there's, a, there's issues with that. So we bring them under our own entity and manage them in a better way. And it's managed through, through life, right? So literally from production through end of life, we're managing, we've spent, last year we spent over $15 million on emissions detection and monitoring equipment for the company. Um, we've been cited by the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership, which is the global um, standard for emissions reduction. We've been awarded by them for two years in a running, the gold standard, not just because of what we've done in the past, but the path that we have to reduce emissions longer term. And what, and the key focus of that is actually measuring emissions. We have the opportunity to do that because the GNA structure, we've got operators out in the field that are going to these wells Maybe not every day, but every other day or every week, depending on the size of the production. They are empowered from this $15 million. They've got handheld equipment. We do LIDAR flyovers. We do um, through Bridger um, Photonics, which does um, helicopter in Appalachia. And we've got a number of what I would characterize as innovative technologies that were partnered with a lot of emissions providers right now there's an arms race on all of this stuff like who's going to have the next best um gimmick out there or or the next best technology out there and we're utilizing a lot of these and 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 giving them feedback have y'all shot any content on this in, in terms of like sent camera crews out and yeah filmed it oh, yeah that'd be cool yeah no so so we've we we've been heavily engaged with the regulators in our in our different operating areas. So our operating areas are Appalachia, right? So West Virginia, Ohio, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Kentucky to some extent. And then what we characterize as our central region. So Oklahoma, which is really Western Anadarko Basin, um, Texas, which is East Texas, Cotton Valley and Haynesville and Louisiana, and then a little bit in the Barnett as well. So yeah, so we we've We've had regulators out to um, our sites. We've had state legislators from those different environments out to our sites and done a number of you know um, tours for them so they understand. We had the Department of Environmental Protection out to our site to see a asset retirement job that we did and, and retired the well, and here's how it's done. So I think it, it's, there's always going to be naysayers out there. But I think we're doing our part to really kind of manage our assets in a stewardship way. And, and it's really a focus of the company. And there's a couple other things we focus on. And it's the culture, too, that we have installed in, in our employees. So we've got 1,600 employees. The vast majority, let's call it 85% of them, are out in the field, not guys like me working in the office, right? right. They're, they're, they're on the ground managing these assets on a day in day out basis and a lot of them have come from bigger emp companies right whether it be chesapeake or eqt or some of these others and have gone through either downsizing or 
have been experienced with bankruptcy, um, you know, problems in their assets. So they look at us and they say, here's an operator that's got sustainable cash flows that has a longevity of life that provides opportunities to the communities which we work in. I mean, one of the interesting aspects of last year when we did our sustainability report, we did an economic impact analysis. So in that 10 state operating area, we've returned $510 million to royalty owners in that last year alone. Into, and some of those areas are, are fairly impoverished in Appalachia, um, so they need the money. We, I guess, as I mentioned, employ 1,600 people, but you know, ancillary employment, employment from service operators um, or other contractors, it's over 5,500. We've paid $250 million in taxes. So when you add up all of these economic uh, impacts, it's, you know, again, it's publicly disclosed. It, it's roughly a billion dollars worth of um, GDP impact that we have on these operating communities. We talked about this uh, yesterday on the other podcast I do, Big Digital Energy, that actually in the United States, higher energy prices are a net positive to the economy for all the things you just listed That's out. That's right. You know, where historically it was a drag on the economy, it led to higher inflation, et cetera. But we, you know, the shale revolution and what we've done in energy over the last 25 years has actually reversed that. We, uh, it seemed like we were always going out to uh, the dedication of a softball field or a right. baseball field that one of our companies had put in right. and, and the like, because it's, it's amazing how you can really impact these areas um, by running a responsible organization yeah. and operation there. So Yeah, we're, we're heavily involved in the communities, especially in, in Appalachia and especially in West Virginia, because that's where Rusty, our founder, is from and still owns property out there. So he's, he's heavily involved. We give back, you know, we, we do, um, you know, sponsor, to your point, you know, the 4-H, um, different organizations, uh, West Virginia University, West Virginia State University. Uh, we partnered with them um, to, they've got an environmental science program, and we partnered with them to plant trees because we, through um, part of the state, we um, put in a new gathering line. So we kind of had to, you know, we had an easement that we had to address. We put, we're planting trees to kind of reforest what we kind of took away. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, all right. So I need one kind of crazy oil and gas story out of you. I'll go first with okay. mine because it kind of has to do with what we're talking about. I am blanking on the guy's name. But anyway, he had a classic old school Appalachian uh, production company in Kentucky. And we went and looked uh, to invest in it. And you could tell this guy was really good with taking the, the dumb finance guys around in the field. So we're driving around. And uh, anyway, so we're going and looking at wells. And we drove past somewhere and there was a sign for one of his wells pointing up that way and he goes yeah we don't go to that one and i'm like why is that and he goes well jim bob has his still right next <laughs> to the well and we keep telling him you don't want your still next to the well because it might explode but he shoots at us every time we go there right so we just leave that one well alone yeah <laughs> and so there, there is some of that. that uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, in, in let's call it rural Appalachia, there is definitely um, that type of stuff that goes on. Um, so I'll tell you two stories. All right. So, uh, so, so one was when I was the newer guy, right, in on the banking side in my previous life, um, I got tasked with doing you know a due diligence trip. So I, then I find out where the due diligence trip is. So it's in January third week of January, we've got to fly to Dickinson, North Dakota. Oof. So it is, we take off from Colorado. There, we're coming into the airport there. We're about 15 minutes out. And the pilot calls up. They're like, start up the, start up the cars. We go into the hangar. Don't even, like, the, right into the hangar. They close the door. The cars are running. It's negative 40 degrees outside. Nice. So, so that was kind of the, the young guy getting the, the, um, the, the low man on the totem pole due diligence trip. 
Um, the other thing that I would say that was an interesting aspect of uh, my career as I moved to the corporate side was we did an analyst day at one of my previous companies, and we were heavily focused on drilling what we characterize as the super long lateral. So I worked for a company called Eclipse Resources. So we drilled a number of the longest laterals onshore at the time um, in North America. Uh, one of them was 22,500 feet, and that's just the lateral portion. So we did an analyst day in New York, and I put together the PowerPoint presentation, picked a spot in Central Park to where we were doing it at the New York Stock Exchange and said, that's how long the lateral is for the well that we just drilled. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it was, a, it was an interesting aspect. Oh, I like that. I like that presentation because, I mean, people people don't realize outside the industry just how incredibly technologically sophisticated we are to be able to yeah. do that stuff. Because I mean, you're talking a hole this big, you know. I mean, it's not, and and you're putting it within you know fifty feet of something, which right. is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. The the uh, I uh, I had one of the the funny banker meetings early in my career when i was the the young associate on the deal we were sitting there and we we're looking to take a, a company public and they put up their drilling schedule for the next year and i could have asked this question thank god i didn't but the young associate next to me uh from a firm that shall not be named morgan stanley right <laughs> actually said Hey, of these uh, wells that you drill next year in the drilling schedule, which one of them are going to be the dry holes again? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, half of me thought he was actually being snarky and uh, and uh, sarcastic, but no, just kind of flew right over the head. So, well, so so what I wanted to do before I left, and I would yep. be remiss if I did this. So, as I mentioned, we focus a high degree on culture at our company, um, right. and and the culture especially uh, of our employees and how we kind of live, work every day. Um, and one of the things we present to our employees when they start is the challenge coin. So I don't know if you know about the history of challenge coins, where they came from, a kind of a, a, a token of appreciation for people that, you know, it started with the military that have done service to, to their, their, um, their country or given portions of, you know, uh, their service to others. And so in the, so we're giving you this. Oh, cool. It's a, the diversified energy t challenge coin that just, that's the new one for this year. It's got on it. Um, it is really focused on our, our main aspects, which is production, transport and retirement of our assets. And it's got our four daily values on there, which is enjoyment. We want employees to enjoy coming to work focus on production, focus on being good stewards of the environment. So be it for you and uh, in this podcast yeah, and doing your part for the much. energy space and for having me on, there's your challenge. Cole. Very, very cool. Now, how do people find out more about Diversified if they want? So we've got a, a website out there, div.energy. Um, that's out there on, in, the, in the marketplace they could, they could go to. Um, there's obviously um, a number of articles that have been in trade journals about us as well. Um, and a number of research analysts write on us. So, oh, very cool. The uh, since we concluded earlier that we had met before, yep. it was really good to see you. Good again. to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely, this is great.